Hello. Welcome to Law Master's Library. I'm your Law Master. Here today to continue our look at Asian countries to help inspire game masters and players alike for whatever kind of games they're playing at their tables. Though, again, this month, mostly Asian. Our last country is technically not a single country, but instead a history and examination of groups of people who existed long before Mongolia itself was a country. That said, let's begin. The steppe lands of Eastern and Central Asia have been populated by different people for as long as their neighbors have been populated. The elf examples include the Alfonsivo culture of 3300 BC, or around 3300. The Alfonsuk culture of the for around 1450 BC, the slab grave culture of around 1100 BC, and the Chadman culture of around 700 BC. So, as you can see, nomads have long been a part of Asian makeup. But the connection between these nomadic cultures and, of course, tracing them to the future Mongols can sometimes be difficult. Most of what we know of these people come from archaeology and interactions they had with their neighbors, those neighbors mostly being China. The first of these people to be written on was the Xiongnu Confederation. These were the people the Great Wall was built against. They were the first of many tribes in history who subdued all others, becoming an empire who dominated the Eastern Steppe, which, of course, led to many battles against the Han Dynasty. In times, early on, when they managed to clan lame, clan, eh, claim land from China, and many people were first to send over women for political marriages. Though, the secret is that most of these ended up being peasant girls instead of the royalty they were presented as. However, eventually during the Han Xiongnu War, China managed to not only reclaim its lost land, but also pushed far enough into Xiongnu territory to split it into half and force the tribes into becoming a tributary state for China. It eventually become, well, the ancestors of the Xiongnu would eventually become one of the five barbarian kingdoms among the 16 kingdoms, which you can see more about what that means in my China video. But the people were never to become a threat to China again. Though, it is said that a group of them might have split off and became the Huns. We still historically have no idea where the Huns came from, so it's all just theory, but... Anyway, the second one to rise was the Xi'an Bay, who rose after making a deal with the Han, where they would be paid for each Xi'an head they collected. This eventually led to them killing the last Xiongnu emperor, scattering the tribes for a time. The Xiongbei were able to form their own confederation in the Xiongnu's place. However, they were never as strong as Xiongnu, and they only ever raided, and were fractured during the Three Kings era by the way. They did develop some arts and culture, and showed signs of passing Tengrism, which is the main religion that is going to be found among these nomadic people. But the Xianbei's fingerprints in history mostly end here. I say mostly because the fall of the Xianbei led to the rise of the Ruran Cognate. Originally, they were near a tribe of the steppe, maybe an offshoot of the Xianbei who stayed north, while the rest raided southwards. The Ruran did serve as vassals for the Xianbei, at least. Here, they eventually formed their own cognate, made alliances with the Northern Way as mercenaries, and would also intermarry with royalty. And by that, I mean actually intermarry, intermarry with royalty, not the tricks that the Xiongnu fell for. Eventually, the Turks drove them back and they disappeared from history. 
How about theory speculate that the Ruans became anything from the Tartars to the Avars? Again, we don't have much of a history to be able to track all these mysterious nomads that pop out of seemingly nowhere to European thought. So, but regardless, we now reach the rise of another confederation of tribes, the Gok Turks, often shredded to Turks or are referred to as Blue Turks. Originally, starting as the Ashina clan of nomads, which some claim are some of the last remnants of the Xiongnu. So, that just might be the all important civilization not bothering to tell barbarians apart. So, anyway, the group would eventually take the reins of the region with the dissolving of the Ruan Cognate, first butting heads with the Sui before the rise of the Tang. The fight would eventually resolve with the main body of the Turks giving up their empire and moving north beyond the Great Wall to the Gobi Desert. Here, they eventually did manage to form a second empire, but it only lasted a hundred years before the next power took the stage. But even with the empire scattered, their people spread across Central Asia, and some even managed to make their ways all the way to modern-day Turkey. Next, not chronologically, but for us to talk about, is the Zui Yanto. Actually, two tribes coming together, the Zui tribe had first been mentioned before during the Three Kingdoms era, but was not found in history again until around 700. The Yanto, on the other hand, are also remnants of the Xiongnu, who became vassals to China after their own empire broke up. Together, the Tang used both tribes as mercenaries to open a war against the Turks' first empire. Afterwards, the Tang would then put them in charge of the region, only to take it for themselves two decades later. For the next three decades, the air would be under the control of the Tang as a protectorate until the Turks' said Second Empire came and pushed the Tang back. The next to come along was the Yorga Cognate. The Yorgnas were, which I'm, again, disclaimer, I'm probably pronouncing all these wrong, but I, these specifically I want to apologize for because of their current peoples. But Yorgnas were one of the many Tiel tribes, and the same tribal group that the Zui and the Yanto were part of. After the fall of the first Turkish cognate, they had defected to the Tang. They would eventually fight the second Turk cognate and capture the Turkish capital, allowing their own rise as the Khans. During their reign, they would work closely with the Tang, stamping out enemies who would rebel against the empire. However, their own desires to fight the Tang eventually led to them being crushed, for a time leading to a lack of barbarian influence that the Chinese needed to worry about. The Yorgas still exist to this day, but in the territory of Xianjing, where they are, let's just say, not treated well, since we're not dealing with modern issues today. But the Tang's would eventually collapse, bringing about the southern and northern period. And the north was not a Chinese nation, but one the nation which is known as Liao. Ancestors of the Khitan people were recorded as early as around the third century, which the stories tell of a harrowing journey of how the Ruan cognate and the nations of Goyo, see Korea video, pushed the eight Khitan tribes south, where they kept in confederation with other tribes until the Tang collapsed, where they then managed to beat the Edas to become the dominant force in the northern half of China, which they not only took over that half of China, but they did so in the style of a Chinese emperor 
instead of a con, Nate. Even with the Chinese trappings, however, the military was still in the style that is referred to as a horde. But it certainly had one of the largest cavalry seen up until that time. Not a fun fact is that women were, you know, expected to do as much as men and not treated like simple possessions. Their religion was also unique, adapting Buddhism, Confucianism, and Taoism, and synthesizing them together. And as one of the first of these nomadic nations to work to build a dynasty instead of a what they had been building before, the Liao are known to influence arts in various ways, including statuary art, them preferring statues over paintings, poetry forms, and theater forms. But now, we get to the big one. While the Liao were ruling northern China, in the traditional steppe lands of their people, a new group is forming, the Mongols. From the 9th century to the 13th century, various tribes began to form, with them one day under Genghis Khan to unite uh, under a single Mongol identity. Let us do a quick short list of the tribes, just so you get an idea of the makeup of the original Mongols. Of the main tribes, there were 37. 19 were descended of, of the Mongol hero Bodokar Munkhag, and 18 others were, of course, not. In addition to the center, center Mongol tribes, there was also the Tatars, like you mentioned earlier, there were Mongolized Turks, who called themselves Marquettes, and the Nestorian Christians, who were referred to as Karaites. Other tribes of note, general singular tribes, are the Naimans of the Mongols' western borders, the Ungars, who lived alongside the Great Wall, and the Duglat tribe, which, from my research, does not have that much information from before the Mongols' rise, but they sure had a lot of power after the Mongol nations were set. Then we have the rise of Genghis Khan, who managed to ga gather the tribes to declare him ruler of all Khans. He led the Khans into becoming the largest empire in history, dominating China, Central Asia, Middle East, and even pushing their way into Central Europe. They perfected the use of horse archers and created an army independent of supply lines so nothing could slow them down. Of course, this also made the limit to their expansions sea-based or water-based, like their failed attempts to conquer Japan or their defeats against Mamluks and Crusaders along major rivers. The empire took in every religion, from the native religion of Tengrism to Buddhism, to Christianity, to Manichaeism, to Islam. Writings of the Mongols included the secret history of the Mongols and the universal history, both of which is how we got our main sources of both the formation of the Mongols and the history around that time across the empire. They also liked paintings of horses, especially more than people. People are born. Mongol Khans also established many observatories and the Yam mail system, which is history's first recorded mail system. However, disagreements of who would inherit Genghis Khan's legacy would eventually lead to infighting, breaking his empire into four pieces. However, each of the four pieces were influential in its own right. Let's continue going through them. Yuan was founded by Kublai Khan, the grandson of Genghis Khan. Kublai was also the Great Khan, but the divisions of the empire happened in his lifetime, so that title suddenly became much less important. The nation originally came about through the conquest of China, which took a few generations to complete. It was much more easier for the Khans to march rest, but we will get there in a second. I spoke briefly, briefly of the Yuan when I talked to China, so 
let's focus more on achievements of this era. Despite taking the form of a Chinese dynasty, the actual government was made of several different concepts of governments from across Asia. The Yuan were known for the production of saltpeter, porcelain, and playing cards. They were also famed as the inventors of the first emissary, not inventors, they were known for inviting the first emissaries from Europe to China. Mathematics, medicine, printing, and porcelain all saw advances during this era. The Yuan was the only faction of Mongols who never fully converted to Islam, but it, Buddhism, Christianity, and Manchism could be found throughout the dynasty. Don't mention like all others, the Yuan would come to an end with the rise of the Ming Dynasty, which again, see the China video for that. Second, we have the Chagatai Khanate, also known as the Dumdadu Mongol Olas. I'm not going to pronounce that right either. I have trouble enough with regular. Asian languages. I'm not going to be able to pronounce Mongol. Anyway, which comprised most of Central Asia, the place where Kazakhstan, Turkmenistan, and other countries like that are today. This era was originally ruled by Genghis Khan's second son, Chagati Khan. Of course, this region was vassal to the empire of the Great Khan, but Around the time of Kublai Khan, they were already fading in their loyalties, and even started fighting against the Yuan Dynasty and another one, the Yokanate. Eventually, the empire were divided in two, with a part of it going into the famed Timurid Empire. This would still leave the Khanate, now referred to as the Mughalstan Khanate, in charge of the eastern half of the former nation. Before, as the years went on, the country divided into more rival continents, before eventually disappearing from history altogether. The third of uh, faction of the Mongols, controlling the Middle East, was the Ilkhanate, also known as Iran. Iran, of course, haven't existed since ancient times, though the Europeans continued to refer to it as Persia. Regardless, the local rulers continued to call themselves by Iran, to mark themselves as the heirs of the Sassanid Empire of pre-Islamic Iran, which of course, they would go on to adopt Islam, but the thought was there. It was ruled by Hulagu Khan, brother of Kublai Khan, when the empire was divided having been the one to eventually finish off the orders known as the Order of Assassins. One of the first dividing acts of the empire was the Golden Herd alleging Iran killed three diplomats and having war declared on them, leading to some of the earliest struggles between the Mongol states. Unfortunately, most of existence was spent warring with both the Chigate and the Golden Herd, and a wave of the Black Death swept through the Middle East was a nail in the coffin of the Ikhanate, being the first of the four to be dissolved. Finally, we have the Golden Horde, which controlled Siberia, parts of Europe, and large chunks of the Cossacks Mountain. Founded by Kublai Khan's cousin, Batu Khan, the Golden Horde had a long-standing achievement of extracting tribute from Kiev Rus, while of course fighting with the other cognates. They eventually could not convert to Islam like its other others, but only would find themselves in the middle of what are referred to as the Great Troubles, which divided the Horde into three. Various attempts were made to re-establish the Horde, including the most successful attempt being the Great Horde, but Few lasted more than a couple decades. Russian expansion would eventually conquer the last remaining territories of the Mongols, the last ones remnants of the Golden Horde being Crimea, which was conquered in 
1847. But the Mongols did not fall with the Mongol Empire. Another group, the Oirats, or Western Mongols, still existed independent from the Empire. They had submitted to the Mongol Empire, but it was not until its collapse that this group shined. The last remnants of the Yuan Dynasty eventually placed themselves as heads of the Oirats. Who, who continued on as the last remnants of the empire, empire until, well, the last emperor's death. When the Ming dynasty demanded they, that the Orates spend the knee, they managed to defeat the Ming's first soldiers. They continued their raids against the Ming, but eventually the disunity of the tribes and the continuous push westwards with every defeat eventually broke the Orates apart. Then coming at the end, we have the Dzungar Khanate. Though many members of the Orat Mongols moved to the Xinjiang region. As one last attempt to revive the scattered tribes of the Mongols, they petitioned, petitioned the Dalai Lama of Tibet for a leader to be elected, and eventually established Bosch Oktu Khan as the new leader of all the Khans to rally around. Then they conquered the bet, of course. <laughs> they managed to defeat the last remnants of the Chagati and spread across parts of Central Asia and most Siberia. But even from the beginning, there was succession disputes between the sons, which did not help things when the Qing dynasty began knocking on their doors, nor when the Chagati would eventually rebel, trying to regain their independence. The Qing would conquer, and after two failed rebellions, and they would genocide the Dengars. And until 1911, the steppes were under complete control of China. So, let's finish this up with one last summation. Mongolia is more than just Mongolia. Nomadic tribes have existed in the areas around China, for many thousands of years, long before history was written, always referring to, to by their neighbor China as barbarians. However, as much as they would spend their centuries as either barter or puppet to wider China, that does not mean the Mongols were the only tribes to rise above. As China became its own nation, the people of the steppes were right there with them. Some were massive threats who not only gave China trouble, but expanded all the way to influence Europe. Maybe. Others were never more than a hindrance to the larger nation around them, even at times working as mercenaries for China. But eventually a group of tribes would unite as one, being able to rise as the single largest empire in history, conquered most of Asia, usually only being stopped by major water sources due to lack of naval abilities. But the infighting would be what would eventually bring them to an end. Four nations not being able to stand as well as one. And disease and expansion of other nations would eventually wipe the remnants off the map. But even as the empire collapsed, the last remnants held on for another few hundred years. Working to build, to raid, being pushed back again and again, only to finally be wiped out in 1757. 150 years before our arbitrary stopping point. Even though they would be independent again, that is not what we are here today to talk about. We leave off approaching the modern era with the existence of our last country waiting to be reformed. And that is the end of these four videos. Thank you everyone who watched this video and my other videos this month. I have one more video coming to round off the year, but I hope these last few videos gave you all a general idea of how you might use an age, the history of Asia to inspire your own tabletop games, characters, etc. But until next time, have a wonderful new year.